if you'll please come and find a seat. How are we doing? You got it up? There you go. Good. Put the title of the book up. I think that's a better, better opening screen, no? No? Okay, never mind. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that, good. Good evening, welcome to Valley Beth Shalom. Please find a seat. We're delighted to welcome you tonight. We're gonna open the door, put out a few more chairs, so if you haven't found a seat yet, we will make sure that you're as uncomfortable as possible. Which is a synagogue, we're, that's the business we're in. Uh, I'm Ed Feinstein, I'm one of the rabbis here at VBS, and I'm delighted to welcome you. Tonight's presentation is a joint presentation of the Valley Beth Shalom College of Jewish Studies and the University of Southern California Kazan Institute. The Kazan Institute is a Jewish Studies Institute at USC, and they have initiated a new program called SC Comes to Temple. It's about time. Now, it's nice that they're here. And they'll be a appearing in synagogues around the area, and we're delighted tonight to welcome Professor Ross and his associate, Lisa Ansel, who have brought uh, the Kazan Institute its scholarship and its research out into the community so all of us can enjoy. I know that, I'm stalling. I'm stalling so everything works out. Good, in addition to all of that, this week we welcome a wonderful artist. This is Mordechai Rosenstein, who is a wonderful, world famous Jewish artist. And his works are on display in the hallway. They're beautiful, we have them displayed all over the synagogue because each time he comes, I'm a sucker, I buy a lot of this stuff because it's just remarkable Jewish art, the way that he takes Jewish letters and Jewish phrases and, and the, 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 the imagery of, of, of Jewish calligraphy and makes beautiful art out of it. Um, tomorrow night, you'll have a chance to take an art class with Mordechai. He's going to be doing an evening that we call Pino and Painting. A little wine, a little art, a little art, a little more wine. Pretty soon it melds together, and you've created something beautiful, right? Definitely. There, there you go. When the wine flows, the art flows. So tonight, we invite you after the, during the break to come up the hallway and take a look at all the pieces that are on display, and tomorrow night to enjoy uh, uh, an evening of art with, uh, with Mordechai. And then over the weekend, he's going to be our guest on Shabbos, uh, during, after shul, on Shabbos, after lunch, at about 12.30, he's going to give a talk about his art and how he creates these marvelous pieces. So please join me in welcoming Mordechai Rosenstein to VBS. Thanks. So good to have you here. Great to have you. Thank you. Now, a couple of announcements while we're getting these chairs set up. Um, tonight is the Valley Beth Shalom College of Jewish Studies, and we are world famous for offering university-level learning with no quizzes, sororities, or football teams. Um, we are studying this, this year the, uh, a survey of Jewish history, uh, and we are into the modern period, and tonight's lecture fits well into our conversation about Jewish power and powerlessness in America and, and beyond. Next week, our guest will be uh, Dr. Gil Graf, who's the executive director of the Bureau of Jewish Education, and he's gonna be talking about the modern religious movements that arose in Europe and came to America. What is orthodoxy, what is reform, what is conservative, and what difference does it make? And then following that, Dr. S Dr. Uh, Steve Koken, who is a, prof Daniel, I'm sorry, Daniel Koken, Daniel Isaac Koken, who is a visiting lecturer at UCLA, is gonna talk about Israel and Zionism and how sovereignty in Israel has changed us as a Jewish people. So please join us for those lectures. Seven o'clock Wednesday nights, we serve good cookies and the entire deal is free and everyone is invited. As well, this Friday night, you're all invited to join us at 6.30 for a beautiful musical service called Rimonim and we invite everyone to come and join the music and the prayer life. I know, I haven't got there yet. Give me just a moment. I, everyone has suggestions for what I ought to announce. Right, good. Uh, as well, you're welcome Friday night to come and join us for that. On February 26th, which is in about three weeks, we're going to join with the Jewish Republican Coalition to present an evening with Larry Elder, who's a, a commentator on KBC, he was on KBC Radio, now he's on KRLA, 870. Um, and that evening is sponsored jointly by the synagogue and by the Jewish Republican Coalition, and everyone is invited uh, to join us for that. 
Uh, they have a small charge at the door. If you sign up in advance, it's a little cheaper. And if you'd like to be a benefactor and have cake and cookies with uh, Mr. Elder before and after the presentation, they're looking for help and would love to have your support. So please join us for those special presentations. Two other quick announcements. Tonight is Bill Kabacher's birthday. Happy birthday, Billy. Billy is our guest and our usher and our friend, and we want to wish you a very, very happy birthday and hope it's a wonderful special night, and thank you for sharing it with us at VBS. And finally, in the, middle, in the beginning of March, from the 7th to the 15th, we're taking a group of people, a very, very special people, to Israel, and there's a few more spots on that tour if anyone would like to come. This is not a tour for your first time to Israel. If you've never been to Israel before, my colleague and partner, Rabbi Hoffman, goes in the summertime, and he will take you to all the places you have to go. But if you've been to Israel and want to understand how Israel is shaped by the issues, the questions, the dilemmas, and the triumphs of Israeli society, we take this wonderful trip once every three or four years. We meet the people, we visit the places, and we talk about the issues that shape modern Israel. And then every evening we find a fabulous restaurant, eat a huge meal, and celebrate the miracle that is Israel. We'd love to have you along. Alana Zimmerman is this wonderful person in the yellow sweater. She has the tickets for the trip. After the break, go to Alana, tell her, I want to go with Rabbi Feinstein and finally understand Israel. How can I do it? And she will give you the answer to that question. How's that? In addition, in addition to Professor Ross's presentation tonight, there happens to be a wonderful presentation of graphics uh, um, online put together by the Getty Museum and CSUN. It's, I won't give you the digital address because it'll be hard to remember, but it's called In Our Backyard, Resisting Nazi Propaganda in Southern California, 1933 to 1945. This will be on the table outside. Take it down and go home and take a look, and you can see some more resources that will fill in the picture from tonight's conversation. We're delighted you're here. It is a custom in VBS that when we learn together, we do so as a community. So if I can ask your indulgence for a moment, if you'll stand, turn to the folks beside you and say, welcome, we're glad you're here. Don't sit down because you're going to be sitting a long time. But stand up, stand up now. Do this, put your arms around your new neighbors and bring them close. This way, even if you don't like the talk, you can say I stood next to this wonderful person from SC and didn't they smell good. Bring them close. We are honored to take a moment to learn our tradition and so we offer a prayer of thanksgiving for that opportunity. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher kiddushanu mitzvotav et sivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Yaase shalom, yaase shalom, shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Yaase shalom, yaase shalom, shalom aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael. Yaase shalom, yaase shalom. Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael Yaase Shalom, Yaase Shalom Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael Yaase Shalom, Yaase Shalom Shalom Aleinu ve'al kol Yisrael Please be seated. And lest I forget to announce this, during the break and after the lecture, if you would like to pick up a copy of Professor Ross's very fine book, we'd like to welcome Book Soup, who is with us today. Thank you so much. And if you're really nice, the professor will sign it for you. It makes a fine bar mitzvah gift, a good wedding gift, a christening gift, whatever you'd like. <laughs> we are in the process of discussing the whole course of Jewish history. And last week we began, we began our conversation about modernity. One of the features of modern Jewish history, one of the things that makes it a unique moment in the long and remarkable history of the Jewish people, is that after 1,800 years of powerlessness, 1,800 years of not having the capacity to shape the conditions of our own existence, 1,800 years of being the object, but never the subject of our own history. When modernity came, Jews said, no more. 
We will control our own conditions. We will fight back. That manifested itself in the birth of Zionism and the creation of a Jewish state. We, sub we create our own conditions by gaining sovereignty. That manifests its, its, its place in the, in the world, in the Jewish world, by taking a special role in democracy in America and elsewhere. For Jews to stand up and say, we will no longer let the world do to us what it will. We are citizens. We have the capacity to push back. We have the capacity to protect ourselves. We have the capacity to shape the society far beyond our own circle in order to create a safe place for ourselves and our children. That's one of the hallmarks of Jewish modernity and one of its miracles. And tonight, a remarkable story of that, of Jews taking power. Our guide tonight is Professor Stephen Ross, professor of history at the University of Southern California. Professor Ross is a lanceman. He comes from Queens, and his father's a baker. That's all you need to know about him. <laughs> he has a PhD in labor history, and from labor history, he moved into the history of Hollywood, and from the history of Hollywood, he moved into this dom domain. The question of Hitler and his attempts to infiltrate Hollywood and the Jewish conspiracy to push back. A remarkable story and a remarkable storyteller. We're delighted to welcome Professor Stephen Ross. All right, if we could dim the lights a little. I don't know who's... Okay. Well, first, thank you all for coming this evening. I appreciate you turning out and giving up one of your evenings here. Uh, <clears throat> I want to tell you a story this evening. In fact, I want to tell you three stories. Can you all hear me? Okay. Is that better? Okay. I want to tell you three stories this evening. I want to tell you the story of Leon Lewis and the courageous men and women who spied on Nazis and fascists. I want to tell you the story of the Hollywood moguls who funded his spy ring. And then I want to tell you what is perhaps the most remarkable story of all, which is the story of resistance to Nazism coming from the most unexpected source you could possibly imagine, and that is the German general council sent to Los Angeles by Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels. And so let's start just with a graphic illustration of what would it have been like to be a Jew in LA in the 1930s and 40s. And I made this map with my colleague, Phil Ethington, in the history department. <clears throat> Everything you see in red are either Nazis, the swastika, or Nazi organizations, and the F are fascist organizations. And when I first did this map and I showed it to my wife, she said, but I can barely read the street signs. And I said, that's not the point. <laughs> the point is, imagine you are Leon Lewis, who I will tell you more about in a minute, you're on West 7th Street, near Flower, and when you look out of your office window, this is what you're surrounded by. And I want to tell you, I didn't have enough space on the map to put in all the fascist groups. I could have put in another half dozen downtown. But the story begins, take a look at the, this is the book cover, the top image, which you might think is Nazi Germany until you see the American flag. That is celebrating Hitler's birthday at Deutsche House, which is West 15th and Figueroa. Right now, if you go down there, that's a part of the parking lot for the convention center. Equally frightening, the bottom image is Broadway downtown. And during the 1930s, you had Nazi swastika flags flying. Imagine now going downtown, and what would it do to your gut to see a swastika flag proudly displayed and no one giving a damn? My story starts in January 1933, when Adolf Hitler became Reich Chancellor of Germany. Within a few months, in March 1933, he sent out Captain Robert Pape, a World War I veteran, to Los Angeles 
with the orders to start Nazi organizations all along the Pacific Coast and all the major cities. On July 26, 1933, Nazis held their first open meeting at the Altheidelberg Inn, which is just west of downtown on Alvarado Street. And here the next day on the front cover, front page of the LA Record, was this picture of five brown shirts raising their arms in a Nazi salute, wearing swastika armbands. Now this is what you usually think of as Nazis, right? If they're not wearing uniforms, they've got the brown shirts, they're thugs. But in fact, more frightening than these people were the Nazi leadership. Here you have Robert Pape, and I'll show you some more. They don't dress like thugs. They dress in suits and ties. And that's what makes them so frightening because they are so respectable. So as soon as Hitler comes to office, Jews begin to discuss what are we going to do. And one of the great myths of history is that people accusing Jews, and usually Jews accusing Jews of not doing enough, why didn't we fight back? And the answer is we did. We did. But Jews had a divided strategy, deeply divided, and a divided strategy is not the same as no strategy at all. And the main division was the American Jewish Congress, who at that point was led by Rabbi, Rabbi Stephen Wise, wanted to get in the face of Adolf Hitler. And they said, we need to be as aggressive as possible because this man is a bully and all he knows is standing up to him. And so they started that spring an international boycott of all German products until Hitler agreed to stop persecuting not just Jews, but all minorities in Germany. Well, the other side of the debate was the American Jewish Committee, which was led by Judge Proskauer of the firm Proskauer Rose. And he argued that strategy is going to backfire, that Hitler will only double down if you get in his face, and that the best way to move his policy towards Jews is to work with religious leaders in Germany and do it through backdoor negotiation. Well, this went on, this debate, unresolved, until that July when the Nazis held their first open meeting. And at that point, Leon Lewis said, something must be done. Enough talk, we need action. So who is Leon Lewis? He is the hero of my book. He was born in Wisconsin in the late 1880s and he wound up going to law school at University of Chicago. He graduated there in 1913. And rather than taking a job with a regular law firm to make money, he believed in the concept of tikkun olam, heal the world. And so he was one of the first three people to found the Anti-Defamation League. He was their first executive secretary, monitoring anti-Semitism throughout the United States, and also working as the ADL's representative to the motion picture industry, monitoring movies for anti-Semitic images. Leon Lewis goes off and fights in World War I. He goes in as an enlisted man and comes out as a captain. And the wartime experience shook him to the core. And what shook him more than anything else was the realization that human beings could kill one another simply because they were ordered to. Here were young men, German men, American men, French men, British men, killing one another for no reason other than their superior officer said, kill that man. And they did. And what Lewis thought is, well, wait a minute. If Americans could kill Germans because somebody told them to, what if those Salem Americans were told, kill those kikes, kill those blacks, kill those Catholics? And he realized that was not out of the realm of possibility. When he saw the story in the newspaper about the first Nazi meeting, what upset him more than the meeting was a little paragraph at the very end that said the, the, uh, the Nazi group was then called the Friends of New Germany, which they remained their name until 1936, when to sound more American, they changed it to the German-American Bund. 
And in 19, and, uh, he, in the paragraph it said that in the Altitel Bergen, the Friends of New Germany were in fact creating a uh, residence for homeless Germans in the basement where they could have free food, free housing, and all they had to do was be instructed in the tenets of National Socialism by the propaganda minister, Hans Winterhalder. Well, Leon Lewis understood that was not something that was innocent. Leon Lewis, when he came back from war, persuaded his two co-workers that in fact, we needed to monitor anti-Semitism in Europe, that things were gonna get worse for Jews. And like anyone who here who's belonged to an organization, if you have a good idea and say, well, we should start this, you're usually the one who then gets assigned to doing it. So Leon Lewis also became the executive secretary of the International Division. So there is no one in America, I would argue, <coughs> who followed Hitler's rise to power in the 1920s more closely than Leon Lewis. And when he read about housing veterans in the basement, he understood that the Nazis in America were trying to replicate Hitler's strategy in Munich in the 1920s. Who were his first brown shirts? They were disgruntled World War I veterans who had been patriots to their country. They had fought for their war, for their country in a war. And when they came back, they were thrown on the ash heap of history. No one gave a damn, no one gave them money. If they died, tough luck. And he knew that the Nazis were gonna to try to recruit from there. And then the Nazis, he realized, were probably also gonna to try to recruit American veterans into their army. Because at that first meeting, what the Nazis announced is we have two goals. We're gonna save America from the two greatest threats, communism and Jews. The Los Angeles and LA County, Orange County, San Diego County had the largest uh, collection or concentration of World War I veterans in the entire United States. Over 150,000 World War I veterans were here. And like Germans after the war, they were angry with their nation. Why? Because when Roosevelt assumed office on March 1st, 1933, the first thing he did with Congress was to pass the Economy Act of 1933, which slashed military pensions from what they had been getting of $80 to $100 a month down to $20, and in many cases, nothing at all. And American veterans were angry, and Lewis knew these were the people the Nazis wanted to recruit. They wanted to recruit World War I veterans, particularly officers, because they were men who had been in combat, who had seen death, and who weren't gonna back down in the face of any kind of problem. And so Lewis decided if they wanted to recruit veterans, he was going to give them veterans to recruit. He was a member of both the Disabled American Veterans and of the American Legion. And for those of you, when you if you, depends from here, you're probably taking the 101 to downtown. But if you ever go the 10 to downtown, right before you hit the 110, you'll see on the right side Bob Hope Patriotic Hall. That was built in 1926 by the county supervisors to house veteran groups. And Lewis was a veteran, was, was the, in fact the chair of the Americanism Committee for both the Disabled American Veterans and for the uh, American Legion. And he went and he recruited one of his fellow veterans, John Schmidt, Captain John Schmidt, who he knew the Nazis would regard as the perfect recruit. John Schmidt was born in Germany. His father was a general in the German army. His brother was a high-ranking officer in the German army. He had been a cadet in the German army at the age of 16 and then decided to come to America. He came to America, enlisted in the army, fought with General Pershing in Mexico, and then fought in World War I against his own family. But he fought as an American. And he knew that the Nazis would welcome him in because the idea was Schmidt would then help recruit other Americans and help train them as an officer. So Leon Lewis went and he not only recruited Schmidt, he recruited four 
veterans, and their wives, and asked them to join every Nazi and fascist group in LA and spy on them and to send him daily reports on what they discovered. Those daily reports were then typed up by Lewis's secretary and much to my gratitude all these years later, sit in over 200 boxes at Cal State Northridge in their special collection. So he recruited Schmidt, he recruited Captain Carl Sunderland, Whoop. Major Bert Allen, and his only Jewish spy in the entire time of the operation, William Conley, who was the head, the president of the Disabled American Veterans, and he was willing to risk them discovering he was a Jew, but he thought he could hide it. When you're William Conley, it doesn't sound very Jewish, because Conley, in fact, was touring the country blasting Roosevelt, who the Nazis referred to as Rosenfeld, the first Jewish president. Well, within weeks of going undercover, they discovered a series of Nazi plots. Not only did the Nazis operate out of the Alt Heidelberg, but they opened up the Aryan bookstore downtown. And the Aryan bookstore was the center for German propaganda on the Pacific coast. You could buy the latest German newspapers, Der Strom was you could buy there. You could buy all the anti-Semitic uh, tracts, all of Hitler's speeches. You could also get copies of the Dearborn Independent. Henry Ford's anti-Semitic paper, as well as copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Any kind of anti-Semitic, anti-communist literature you could find. And of course, from time to time, whether it was Jews or communists, as you can see, broke the windows. The man standing in the light-colored shirt uh, suit is Hermann Schwinn, who is in fact the head of the Friends of New Germany after Robert Pape and he rises up to become the number two Nazi in America. And this is Hans Winterhalder, who is his chief of propaganda, and Paul Themlitz, the number two man who also owns and runs the Aryan bookstore. And again, look at them. Particularly for Christian Americans, they don't see them as thugs. They see, see them as respectable Germans, you know, who are patriots to their country. Well, within, as I say, within four weeks, Leon Lewis's men uncovered a plot to sabotage uh, military installations and a plot to seize armories in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Diego. The four men met Dietrich Gefkin, who had fled Germany in the 1920s after murdering two communists, shooting them to death. He then wound up in San Francisco and joined the San Francisco National Guard. And while he was a guard member, he, he uh, drew up a blueprint of the entire San Francisco Armory, where every piece of ammunition was, where every weapon was, where the officers would stay, where the enlisted men would stay. He then went to, down to San Diego and worked with the Nazis' American brethren in hate, the Silver Shirts, who were buying, were illegally buying weapons, both rifles and machine guns, from corrupt Marines in the San Diego Armory base. And Gefkin told them, or boasted, that his plot was on a certain day, he would have a group of troops, and the troops would be both in every Friends of Germany organization along the Pacific coast, in San Francisco, Portland, LA, San Diego, there were secret stormtrooper units, which they simply referred to as, uh, they would tell the first House on American American, House on American Activities Committee, we're not stormtroopers, we're just a group of guys who get together to go hiking and to sing songs. But his spies reported that in fact they were training both on the second floor of the Alt uh, Heidelberg, and then they were going in the Hollywood Hills, in the Palisades, training in arm-to-arm -arm combat. And on a certain day, those people, the stormtroopers from inside of the Nazi headquarters, the stormtroopers who came on every German vessel that docked along the Pacific coast, and their silver shirt American brethren 
Because remember, Germany had the brown shirts, Italy had the black shirts, Mexico had gold shirts, and America had silver shirts. Shirts made only by other silver shirt members because they said they wanted no Jew to ever touch their clothing. Now, Leon Lewis was no spy master. He was a Jewish attorney who felt that he had to answer the call of his conscience. And his conscience asked them the following, what do we do as Jews when hate groups begin to move from the margins to the mainstream of America and when government authorities seem either complacent or complicit? And his answer is, well, I'm going to start a spy ring. I'm going to gather enough evidence to show that these people are plotting against America. And then I'm going to turn them over to the authorities. And then the authorities will investigate them. Because what do I know about investigating? Well, once he found out about the plot, he went to see police chief James Tugun Davis, known as Tugun because he won the National Policeman's Pistol Shooting Contest with both his left hand and his right hand. And he is the man who coined the infamous phrase, shoot first, ask questions later. That's James, that, there's, there's one you can use with your friends. Who coined that term? James Tugun Davis. Well, I can tell you, if you go in the Cal State archives and you pull out the box with this memo that he wrote after the meeting with Davis, you can feel the heat coming out. 80, more than 80 years later, the heat rises. Because he writes in his memo, I began telling the police chief what Gefkin was plotting. And two minutes into my description, he stopped me and he said, you don't get it. Hitler's doing what he needs to do to save Germany from the Jews. The Jews are the ones causing all the problem, not Hitler and his people. And in fact, in America, and in Los Angeles, the th real threat we face here is not from these Nazis, it's from all those communists in Boyle Heights. And he let them know that as far as he was concerned, every Jew was a communist and every communist a Jew. And he threw him out of his office. Politely, but threw him out. Lewis then went to Sheriff Biscaloos, our sheriff in charge of the county. And here is a signed photograph from George Gisling, the German, the Nazi council, to his good friend Biscaloos. And they were friends. They socialized together. And Biscaloos, of course, threw him out as well, said, I'm not interested. In fact, when the district attorney's office raided the Ku Klux Klan headquarters, because we were one of the largest centers of Ku Klux Klan, act, Ku Klux Klan activity in 1922, they found a list of 1,500 members, many of whom belonged to the police department and the sheriff's department. He then went to the Justice Department, where he found the sympathetic voice, but the man there said, there's nothing I can do unless I'm ordered to by Washington. And the problem is J. Edgar Hoover, who I don't have the evidence, but I believe in my gut, and my gut as a historian is almost never wrong, was an anti-Semite. And what we do know, he was an anti-communist. And he, he only had 300 agents in 1933. And as far as he's concerned, he wasn't going to have one single agent monitor Nazis. He was going to have them monitor commies and Jews, because that was the threat to America. And at that point, Leon Lewis knew he had to keep the spy operation going. If no one was going to do it, it had to be him. Except he had one problem. How's he going to fund this? Because most of these men were either unemployed or dramatically underemployed. He offered them a very modest stipend and paid their expenses. And he had now run out of money. He had solicited some donations early on. But he had run through that, and in his memos, he talks about he was now paying out of his own pocket. But he had two small children and a wife, and he was going bankrupt because he dropped, basically all his clients left him because they said, you're not paying any attention to us. And they were right. And so he turned to the men he believed could help him, the moguls. Turned to Louis B. Mayer, but most importantly, he turned to Irving Thalberg, a little bit to Jack Warner, 
but to Rabbi Edgar Magnin from Wilshire Boulevard Temple, and the most important person of all, Mendel Silberberg. How many of you know the name Mendel Silberberg? I, there's always two or three. How many of you know the name Lou Wasserman? All right. Imagine Lou Wasserman on steroids. <laughs> Mendel Silberberg, as powerful as Wasserman was, he's a piker. He's a pisher. Mendel Silberberg was <clears throat> the most powerful entertainment attorney in America. He represented most of the studios, and he represented the studio heads personally. He represented most of the uh, major actors in town, and he was one of the five Republican kingmakers, which meant he was one of those five people who went into the proverbial smoke-filled rooms at the GOP convention and decided who the next presidential nominee was going to be. There could be no more important person for Leon Lewis to get as an ally than Mendel, because this was the phone call. When Mendel Silberberg called your office, you said, where do I show up, how often, and when? You did it. So when Leon Lewis explained what was going on to Thalberg, Rabbi Magnin, and Silberberg, Mendel called 40 of the most powerful studio heads, a few producers and directors, in March 1934, and told them to show up at the Hillcrest Country Club. Now, sometimes I get confused and I say they, to show up at Hillside. That would be for, <laughs> for something else. So imagine a night, I believe it's March 13th, 40 cars pull up, 40 limousines, not cars, 40 limousines pull up. It was a red carpet event without the red carpet. And Leon Lewis knew who these people were. And he had worked with them since 1915, monitoring their films. And he knew these were hard scrabble men who, though they were proud of being Jewish, weren't going to give him money just because he was a fellow Jew. So he decided he was going to frighten them into generosity. And what he did is they were all escorted into a private room, and in front of all 40 chairs were copies of the Silver Shirt magazine, The Silver Ranger, which had stories filled with anti-Semitic stories and articles, most of which were denouncing the Jewish moguls. And long before Harvey Weinstein, this stuff was happening. These were both in the newspapers, and these flyers were put up throughout the city. Leon Lewis is introduced by Mendel Silberberg, and he tells them all, you know, you guys pay so much attention to your directors, your writers, your stars, what we call above the line, that none of you pay attention to what's actually happening in your studios below the line with your craftsmen. And he goes around the room and he says, Paramount, did you know that your foremen are firing every Jew who works as a craftsman? He turns to Louis, he says, Louis, did you know MGM is almost 100% Goyish now? And not just Goyish, but Nazis and silver shirts are replacing the Jewish employees. That the silver shirts were organizing the studios below the line, knowing that moguls never paid attention to the blue collar workers. And then he really shocked them. He said, my, my spies have also uncovered hit lists. And some of your names are on that hit list. At the end of the evening, he walked out of Hillcrest with pledges in today's dollars, $424,000, and a promise to continue funding the spy operation until the end. Well, that spy operation would last until 1945. And in the book, I have too many plots and stories, so I want to tell you just two of them tonight. One is uh, the, his ace agent, Charles Slocum, born in Long Beach, excuse me, born in Oakland, raised in Long Beach, too young to go to World War I. But he's an ardent anti-communist, and he joins the Ku Klux Klan in Long Beach in the late 1920s, but quickly discovers that while the Klan shared his anti-communism, they were also anti-Semitic, anti-black, and anti-Catholic. And he didn't believe in hating on these people. He hated communists because he believed they were trying to destroy America, but these other people were Americans. 
And so he wound up going to the police captain of Long Beach and saying, I want to be your undercover spy. I'm going to tell you what's going on in the Klan. And then eventually he went to work for Leon Lewis as his undercover operative. And he penetrates more deeply into the Nazi and fascist leadership. In fact, he becomes and he remains in the Klan. Here's a true hero. He remains in the Klan until after World War II. And not only does he remain in the Klan, but he rises up to become their chief recruiting officer for Southern California. <laughs> so the first plot he uncovers is launched by Ingram Hughes. Ingram Hughes is a failed lawyer who worked for a number of years as a linotype operator at the LA Times, now owned by private local business. Uh, and one day, uh, Ingram Hughes went to his friends who was still working he had printed up this proclamation. And imagine waking up on a Sunday morning, opening your LA Times, and his friends had inserted this proclamation in every single copy of the Sunday Times. And all you need to know, it's, it's an incredibly anti-Semitic document, but the key phrase is, at one point he says, I call upon all Christians to help me enact the final solution, his words, the final solution of the Jewish problem, unobtainable through legislative methods. Well, he decides he's not going to wait for Americans to wake up to the danger of Judaism. And so he decides he's going to have a plot to hang, to kidnap and hang 20 famous L.A. Jews, both some from the movie industry and many from the political world. One of them was Busby Berkeley, who I didn't know was Jewish until I started doing this research. And the idea was these men would be kidnapped on the same night. They would be brought to an abandoned park. They would be hung. And as they were hanging and dying, he would have his men shoot their bodies and try to cut their bodies apart with machine guns. And when, Amer when news came out the next morning, that these 20 men had died in such a horrible fashion, he said, this is going to start bloodbaths throughout America, that there are all these people waiting, waiting to attack Jews, and this is going to encourage them. But he never did it, in part, because Chuck Slocum convinced him that Leon Lewis, who the Nazis and fascists all knew and referred to him as the most dangerous Jew in Los Angeles. They knew Leon Lewis was running a spy ring. They just couldn't figure out who his spies were. And in fact, both the Nazis and the Silver Shirts had people standing across the street from him, from his office downtown, standing, getting there early in the morning and staying there through the evening to see if anyone they knew walked in the building. Because if anyone they knew walked in the building, they knew that was Leon Lewis's spy. So Lewis had told Slocum, we can't take a chance. And so Slocum says to uh, Ingram Hughes, you know, we can do this, but Leon Lewis knows he's got spies, and he's going to know about this. And if we kill them, we're going to be arrested and spend the rest of our lives in jail. Let's postpone this. We, we're not going to stop it. We're going to postpone it until we can figure out who Leon Lewis's spy is. And so Ingram Hughes agrees and it's postponed forever. A year, uh, well, two years later, we have another plot, even more nefarious, by Leopold McLaughlin, the man here on your far left in the light suit, scrunched down. He scrunched down because he's somewhere between 6'6 six, six and 6'8. Six, he is the brother, one of the seven uh, McLaughlin brothers, the most famous of which is Victor McLaughlin, the Academy Award winner, for, of all things, the film The Informer. <laughs> well, six of the brothers are saying Leopold is crazy, but he's smart crazy, and he's dangerous crazy. He's a captain, a former captain in the British military. He fought in the Boer War. He fought in World War I. He also published four books on how to kill with bayonets and how to kill in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was also the world's jiu-jitsu champion. And not only did he barnstorm the world doing jiu-jitsu tournaments, 
but he taught jujitsu to Scotland Yard and to the French Surité. He came to LA hoping to have a career in the movie business, but Victor basically put the word out, do not hire my brother, he's a crazy man. And so he started teaching jujitsu to Nazis, fascists, and the white Russians, the people who brought you the pogroms in uh, what is now Russia. And he goes to Hindenburg Park in September 1937 to celebrate German Day. Hindenburg Park today is known as La Crescenta Park. It's been sanitized. It's 17 miles northeast of downtown, and from 1933 until World War II, <coughs> it was owned and run by Nazis. They held annual festivals there. By 1937, they had Nazi summer camps for young boys and girls who were trained in National Socialism. Well, McLaughlin meets three of the leading fascists in the city. Uh, William Alexander, who is uh, the head of the Silver Shirts, Chuck Slocum, and Henry Allen, who's the head of the first family of fascists in LA. Allen had been the most active fascist since the 1930s, his wife was the head of the Italian fascists in the city, and his son was expelled from middle school for trying to organize the junior silver shirts there. But Henry Allen was a vicious anti-Semite who loved nothing better than to beat up Jews and hopefully kill Jews. And he carried in his car a, you can see here, a kind of big stick, two by four, that he called, proudly called his kite killer. And one day in Chuck Slocum's minute, his, his um, notes to Leon Lewis, he talks, about, in, uh, he talks about Henry Allen pulling his car off the road one day and saying, let me show you how you kill a Jew. And he pulls out his kite killer and he says, Slocum, just stand here. And he shows him how you shove it in the guy's stomach. And when he bends over, you then take it, take that handle there and hit him on the top of the head and just keep hitting him until you crack his skull and he dies. This is, by the way, Hindenburg Park. My editor wanted me to put this as the top image, not the celebration of Hitler's birthday. And I said, no, because this looks like Nazi Germany. But this is Los Angeles, 17 miles from downtown. And they're parading in brown shirts, swastika flags, and the like. Here we have. Hermann Schwinn standing outside Deutsche House. This is West 15th and Figueroa. So Schwinn is part of the plot. McLaughlin brings the four men, well, three men and him, to the House of O'Sullivan on Sunset Boulevard. It says, over drinks, over uh, Tom Collins. He says, let me tell you, I have a bloody good idea. And bloody it was. He was going to solve the Jewish problem in America by blowing up the homes of 24 Hollywood figures, 22 Jews, Louis B. Mayer, Samuel Goldwyn, that kind of group, and two famous actors who were known to be too friendly to Jews, Charlie Chaplin, who was then the most famous man in the world, and James Cagney, who many of you may not know spoke fluent Yiddish from his days working in a store dealing with Jews, so you learn the language. In Yorkville, yes. The idea then is he's recruiting both Schwinn and the Bund, the white Russians who tell him we have some psycho killers who did a lot of the pogroms in Odessa, and the fascists. The idea was they were going to blow up those homes, 24 homes, and like Ingram Hughes, he believed that the minute the word got out that these major figures, the most prominent Jews, in Hollywood, and these two goyim who were traitors to their Christian religion, that they were murdered, it would in fact ignite pogroms throughout America. He talked to them about bloodbaths in every single major American city. Well, Leon Lewis got too nervous about this because it seemed to be getting too close to being real. And so he had Chuck Slocum convince Alexander and Henry Allen 
that in fact McLaughlin was going to turn state's evidence on them as soon as the murders were done. That we would kill the 24 Jews and then he would go to the DA, say, look, I know who did it. I can tell you everything if you give me immunity. And of course the DA would do the deal because they'd be under pressure. So instead Slocum convinced the other two, now this was all made up, but Slocum convinced them that was the case and he said, we've got to turn against McLaughlin before he turns against us. And they did. Now mind you, Leon Lewis called the DA's office in advance and said, play along with these guys. Slocum is my man, but the plot is for real. And so they turned state's evidence. McLaughlin was arrested, but in fact it was never mentioned at his trial. Only in like one day of a newspaper did the story leak out about the murder plots. And the reason is Leon Lewis was a very shrewd man and he decided to play the long game. Because part of the problem, if the full stories of the plots came out, what would also come out is that people in the sheriff's office and the police department were involved in those plots and that McLaughlin had totally hoodwinked naval intelligence. And so it would embarrass, deeply embarrass all of them and so he kept his mouth quiet and they only brought him up on charges of extortion because he was blackmailing a millionaire in uh, Santa Barbara who wanted to be a naval uh, intelligence operative. And so he persuaded them to break into the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League offices with them to get all kinds of inf information. And then once they did, of course, he blackmailed him to keep his mouth shut or else. So McLaughlin is convicted the next spring. He's sentenced to five for extortion. He's sentenced to five years in prison, but told my, the sentence will be suspended if you take the next boat out of here, go back to England and never set foot in America again. And apparently Victor immediately bought him a ticket to go to Liverpool the next morning, and he was gone and never came back. The last story I want to tell you is the story of George Gisling, the Nazi counsel who had been in New York and then was ordered by Hitler and Goebbels to go to LA. Now, you have to understand, for Nazis, despite what you may think, the main city in America for them, for Hitler, was LA, not New York. And the reason for that was twofold. First, the harbors of New York were too closely guarded. It was very difficult to bring in propaganda, money, and spies because the mayor, Fiorello LaGuardia, had those ports closely guarded. And what many of you might know is, yes, LaGuardia was Italian, his father was Italian, but his mother was Jewish. And depending on which side of the Jewish world you're on, that meant Fiorello was a Jew. L.A. was totally open city. L.A. and L.A. County, LA County and Orange County are really the centers of hate groups and right-wing groups in America really emerged out of here. The ports of L.A. were never examined, and so uh, Leon Lewis's spies, I've constantly read reports of going down to the docks with Hermann Schwinn and seeing him getting orders, uh, being given an envelope with red seal on it, and he could actually see money being passed to Hermann Schwinn from the Nazis. And so Nazis were sending in money propaganda and spies through the ports of L.A. The other reason Gisling was sent, and the most important reason, was to stop Hollywood from making any anti-Nazi film. Because both Goebbels and Hitler loved movies, and apparently Hitler watched a movie every night before he went to bed. And both men were convinced that Germany had lost World War I because of the effect of propaganda of Hollywood and the British film industry. And he was determined that Hollywood would not stop his world ambition. That if Hollywood put out enough anti-Nazi films and anti-Hitler films, it could persuade neutrals, both in America and in Europe, to oppose the Reich. And so he was told, uh, he sent, he arrives in LA in uh, the spring of 1933, and he immediately threatens the moguls with imposing Article 15 of the 1931 German import law, which says any studio that produces a film that in any way denigrates the German people 
will have those films banned from Germany. And if a country sends in enough of those films, the entire country's product will be banned. Now this is a very serious threat because Germany's the number two market in Europe next to Great Britain. And many of the moguls think, well, <clears throat> Hitler's not going to be in power. They think one of two things. He's a buffoon and he's going to get thrown out of office soon. Or he'll tone down his rhetoric. Once he's in office, he'll become more statesmanlike. I didn't say anything. <laughs> so Gisling's task was made a lot easier the next year, let me keep it on him, when in um, response to widespread outcry that Hollywood films were too licentious, that Hollywood was perverting American children, perverting American morals, uh, the industry was forced in order to avoid calls for federal censorship they set up their own censorship code and, it, and a group to administer it, the Production Code and the Production Code Administration, and they appointed a Catholic layman, uh, Joseph Breen, to monitor the code. And the code had provision Article 10, which said no studio that wants to get a Production Code seal can make any film that denigrates, mocks, or in any way attacks a foreign nation or its leader. Now, you needed a production code seal to be in a first-run theater, and why that mattered is 70 to 80 percent of all profits came from that first run. And you have to remember, Hollywood is ultimately in the money-making business, not the consciousness-raising business. And no matter what you would want to think, whoever said General Motors, you know, General Motors, DuPont, Ford were selling war materials to Germany. They don't get accused, but the Jews who cooperate with Germany get accused of being traitors to their people. Well, Gisling is very successful at what he does, and he has been the villain of many years of Hollywood histories, and if you watch the uh, uh, net, uh, I think it's Amazon series, The Last Tycoon, he's on that series as well. When I started doing the research, I wanted to know what did Christian elite society think of this man? How did they respond to the number one Nazi in LA? And so I thought the best way to do it is look when they're unguarded. So I read the social column in the LA Times from 1933 to 1941. And what did I discover? Gisling was the most beloved diplomat in the entire city. People swooned over, women swooned over him, men admired him, and they all said, here's a man who speaks multiple languages, he's an intellectual, he's cultured, he actually has a Juris Doctorate from Frankfurt when you had to actually write a PhD thesis. It was a real, it wasn't just three years of law school and you get a JD. He had to go to law school and then he had to write a full doctorate. I also found out his background, he had gone to a special gymnasium in Switzerland that specialized in ancient languages, Sanskrit and ancient culture. And I thought to myself, the more I read, I thought, this man can't be a Nazi. He's, he's too sophisticated. He's too smart. Something is not kosher. And I began thinking of my father-in-law, who was alive at the time I started the book. And he, um, no, actually he had passed away. My father-in-law was in Germany in 1933 in medical school and then was thrown out by Hitler when he expelled the Jews. He went to Padua and was in medical school there for a year until Mussolini threw him out. And he wound up at Northwestern University where he had the ill fortune of uh, meeting Loyal Davis, Nancy Davis Reagan's stepfather, who was on the medical school faculty and announced as my father-in-law told me very publicly that no Jew will ever get tenure at Northwestern Medical School while he's alive. And I used my, my father-in-law was a German nationalist. He loved German music, German culture, German opera, everything. And I asked him, how, how, how can you feel this way after what Germany did, what Hitler did? And his response was, I'm not gonna let this man 
destroy hundreds of years of German culture for me. He's an aberration, and he's not going to continue to dominate my life. And I suddenly thought, hmm. So I started doing a little digging. And many of you probably know the uh, website Ancestry.com. They have a sibling site, for those of you interested in military records, called Fold3. It's fold in the number 3.com. And so I thought, I knew Gisling had gone uh, to Nuremberg, was arrested in, in Nuremberg. So I went through Nuremberg records, and I came across a letter written by this man, Julius Klein, not in 1933, but in 1947. And the letter was written to the um, attorneys, the prosecutors, the Nuremberg prosecutors. And it started by saying, this is the first and only personal testimonial I will ever write for a Nazi because George Gisling is no Nazi. George Gisling is a German nationalist who has been working for the revival of democracy in Germany since Hitler came to power. And from 1933 on, he has been passing me secret information about the German economy, about the German-American Bund. And in 1940, he passed me information about Nazi war plans which have proved enormously valuable to our government. Well, at that point, I said, my gut's right. And then I tracked down his daughter, Angelica, who lived, uh, born in New York, and uh, was 13 when Hitler, uh, when, excuse me, when Roosevelt ordered all German diplomats out of the United States. She had married, after the war, she married a Air Force, American Air Force colonel, who was in uh, Air Force intelligence and moved to Morro Bay, California. And when I uh, went up to visit her, you know, because I knew that every daughter is going to want to think well of their father, so I didn't tell her the full story. First thing she said to me is, thank God you're here. Somebody's going to finally get my father's story straight. And I said to her, well, does the name Julius Klein ring a bell? And she started laughing. She said, yes, the little general. What do you mean? Well, Julius was about maybe 5'4 if he had heels on. And my father was 6'4". So when the two of them were together, that was, they were a strange sight. And Julius used to come to our house all the time. And I said, well, do you know who he was? She said, no, just a friend of my father. And I told her the story. And she said, oh my god, now it makes sense. And I said, what makes sense? She said, well, Julius would come, and my father would take him into his study, have dinner brought to the study, and then lock the doors. She said, in all the years we lived together, my father never locked the door. The only time he locked the door was for Julius. Julius Klein was passing him secrets. And in fact, Julius Klein had started in 1933 with his nephew, Joe Roos, the first spy operation spying on Nazis in Chicago. And Roos at the time was working as a newspaper. He is Viennese born, Berlin raised, came to Chicago in 19. 29, and he's working for the Hearst newspapers, as well as he and his uncle were, writing, were running a German-American newspaper, half in German, half in, in English, for recent emigres. And when the uh, editor, Roos's editor, found out he had this spy ring, he said, I want you to go talk to the publisher. The publisher was Roy Keane, who was also the head of the Illinois National Guard. And Keane, after listening to his story, said, okay, I'd made some inquiries. I want you to go, and he gave him a piece of paper with an address, I want you to go to the Hotel Bismarck, you're going to meet with an army officer, and whatever he tells you, I want you to do, and I don't care if it's company time or not. He shows up to the room, rented just for that afternoon, and he meets an army colonel, he tells him the story, and the army colonel says, this is great, except you have no idea what you're doing, you're going to get yourself killed. I'm going to have my counter-espionage people teach you how to do counter-espionage, how to go in and out of homes, how to do drops, how to avoid detection, the whole nine yards. And Joe Roos does that. Joe Roos will move, moves to L.A. in the 30s, early 30s, and becomes Leon Lewis's associate spy master. Who was the army officer who trained him? You might know the name. From 1933 
until well after the end of World War II, uh, Julius Klein was sending George Marshall regular reports. Julius rose to the rank of Brigadier General during World War II. So Gissling leaves in July 1941, and the very last story before I end is the story of Pearl Harbor. <coughs> Pearl Harbor happens December 7th, and I'm reading the newspapers from the period, and it is clear the morning of December 8th, FBI are given, uh, they get telegrams from the Attorney General with a long list of names of Germans, Italians, and Japanese to arrest. And the FBI is extraordinarily efficient. They get them all. I'm looking at the names. I say, I know all those names. They've got them all. And they're divided into three categories. Very dangerous, dangerous, keep under supervision. But they call it ABC. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute. How is this possible? I got Herman Schwinn's Freedom of Information Act file from the government. Do you know when it started? 1942. And I'm reading through the FBI reports. The FBI is not, there are no reports on Nazis. They're not really telling them. Not at all. In fact, the local bureau writes J. Edgar Hoover in 1940 saying, you know, we need to have a dedicated person just 24-7 on Herman Schwinn. Not only is the head of the American, uh, the uh, Bund, German-American Bund in LA, but he is the Gauleiter for the entire Western region of America, and he is the number two Nazi in the entire United States, the number two Nazi who is hoping to be the number one Nazi in the United States when Fritz Kuhn steps down. Hoover writes back, he said, Hermann Schwinn has broke no law, you can't put him under surveillance. But in the meantime, the entire FBI office is surveying Jewish actors, writers, directors who broke no law. It isn't until November 1941, the middle of November, that I have a memo from J. Edgar Hoover authorizing the LA FBI to put Schwinn under investigation, but first to send that guy to Washington to be trained. Three weeks later, Pearl Harbor happens, and I'm wondering, so how the hell did they know to who arrest? And the answer is, starting in September 1939, at the outbreak of war, Leon Lewis and Joe Roos, knowing that no one was doing anything other than them, literally no one, started sending the FBI, Army Intelligence, and Naval Intelligence, which was listening to him. I have to make a correction. Naval intelligence on the West Coast, not nationally, on the West Coast was listening and working with Lewis. Why? Because Elias Zacharias, who was in charge, was a Jew. They were sending the FBI, Army Intelligence, Navy Intelligence records of every suspected Nazi, Italian, and by 1940, Japanese fascists who needed to be surveyed. And they broke them into three categories. And they had names, addresses, and they had a little remark next to every name. I thought, I oh. so now I know where they got those names. But if you're going to write a history book, you better be sure. So I went to the National Archives, and I actually found the document, the list. And when I compared the FBI list to the list that uh, Lewis and Roos were doing, I realized the FBI just took their lists from Roos and Lewis, retyped it, claimed it as their own, and took all the glory. But Leon Lewis didn't care. You know, he understood something. Any of you who've ever run a big organization know, if you let other people take credit, you can get anything done. So Schwinn is arrested, Hans Deibel is number two man is arrested, and they remain in jail until the end of World War II. The FBI raids Nazi headquarters and they found thousands of pieces of Nazi paraphernalia. So what do we take back from all of this? Again, it is a lesson of the past that I think is, I've been touring the country talking about this book. I've been a professor at SC for 39 years. I've never had the crowds that I have talking about this because everyone wants to know what do we do? Your story is about the past of hate groups 
and Jews confronting them, what do we do today? And the lesson that Leon Lewis and the courageous men and women who worked for him give us is imagine, without ever picking up a gun, without ever using any kind of weapon, they defeated a whole range of enemies, silver shirts, Nazis, the Klan, and their brethren in hate. They defeated them because they believed it was the American thing to do. And people have asked me, well, did the Christians, if there's only one, there are about two dozen spies and a number of informants, but only one of those spies is Jew. So did they think they were working for the Jews? And the answer is, in, it's actually in his records. He said, I never want to make this a Jewish operation. Because for one thing, if it's a Jewish operation, no one's going to believe us. I want to make this an American operation. And what the Christian men and women who worked for him understood is that these Nazis, these fascists, these hate mongers, the white supremacists, they all hated Jewish Americans. They hated Catholic Americans, and they hated black Americans. But they understood one major fact. Everything in that hyphen, before the hyphen, was an adjective. And everything after was a noun, American. And as far as they were concerned, the adjectives didn't matter. The only thing that mattered was the noun, American. And they were not going to stand by and allow a foreign group or even a domestic group to come in and turn American against American, hate American against American, kill American against American. And to paraphrase Leon Lewis's words after, right at the end of World War II, he said that only in a tolerant nation can we truly achieve the American democratic ideal. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let's take a break. Okay. Why don't you tell them? I will tell them. I will tell them. We would like to thank Professor Ross. We'd like to thank the Kasdan Institute and University of Southern California for sharing this lecture with us tonight. Shh. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come in. Come on in. So I take it that every time a history professor gives a talk, you get this many people coming out, right? Is that? In my imagination. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for being here, and thank you for, uh, um, thank you for sharing this remarkable story. Let me just begin with a moment of housekeeping. Tell us a moment what the Kasdan Institute is. And what is, what is SC Comes to Temple? What is this initiative? Right. Well, the Kazan Institute, the full name is the Kazan Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. The donor is Alan Kazan, and we're trying to get him to shorten it to the Kazan Institute for the Study of Jewish Life. We, we are essentially the Jewish Studies Institute on campus. I believe in partnerships. So the first partnership I made was with HUC. So I have a faculty advisory board with about a third of our board members being HUC faculty. And we run um, a series of programs for undergraduates, graduate students, faculty. And then what you all might be interested in is we also have something called Kasdan Conversations. We want to bring um, the kind of topics that would be fun to go here. We do these on Sundays from 4 to 5.30. We do roughly one a month. Uh, and again, not lectures, but a conversation. And we welcome you all to come. Uh, we advertise in the Jewish Journal, or if you look up the Kazan Institute online, there's a place you can ask to be put on the mailing list. And our latest project, I've now been, this is my fourth year as director, and I've gone to a number of Association of Jewish Studies conferences, and I organized a panel two years ago that brought together six of the leading Jewish Studies institutes in the country. Uh, each of them does very different things, including one that's just starting at Fordham, a good Jesuit school being run by a Polish woman. Uh, 
And what I noticed is that what they all had in common is they did a lot of programming on campus and nothing off campus. And I thought, rather than always having people have to come to USC to hear programming, why not have USC go out into the community? And so uh, Lisa Ansel, my associate director, and I created something called USC Goes to Temple. Uh, and right now, we have, this is our first event in partnership with Valley Beth Shalom. Uh, we are working with Wilshire Boulevard, with Sinai, with ECAR, Valley Beth Shalom, and at our last casting conversation, the executive director of the Pasadena Synagogue came and asked us, after she heard we are doing this series, she asked if uh, we would partner with Pasadena. And if any of you here from any other temples please contact me because we are happy to expand it out to as many temples as would like to have programming on their temple, not just always having to come somewhere else. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, and thanks for coming and sharing this with us tonight. Um, let me ask you a personal question. How, how did um, your, your field is labor history. How did you come by this particular story, this particular topic? Well, I moved study. from labor history, as I told the rabbi when we were having dinner. My first book came out in 1985, and no one, it's the middle of the Reagan administration, and no one cared about labor history. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I've just spent nine years of my life from the time I started a dissertation to the time I finished the book. And I'll be honest, I didn't want to spend nine years writing a book that only maybe 150 people would really read carefully. Not even my parents read it. <laughs> they just read the Jewish sections on Cincinnati. And I was very despondent and thought about quitting and I had worked in public policy for Ford Foundation before I started and they offered me more money to start as a, uh, without a PhD than I got with my PhD at USC many years later. but. I felt a calling to be a historian, and I was very disappointed, and my wife said to me, you know, if you put the word Hollywood in the title of a book, people will be interested. So I started writing, and I've spent the last more than 20 years writing about Hollywood and politics. And the last book I did was called Hollywood Left and Right, How Movie Stars Shaped American Politics. And in one of the chapters, it's 10 people, five on the left, five on the right, from Charlie Chaplin to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I was writing a chapter on Edward G. Robinson, and I got very interested in the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League, which was the activity of movie stars, not just liberals and not just Jews, but a lot of conservative stars joined the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League because they opposed fascism and Hitler. And so I wanted to learn more about it, and I saw that online exhibit from Cal State Northridge in our own backyard. And I thought, huh, oh, Nazis and fascists, let me see what they've got. And I went out there and they had like 200, more than 200 boxes. And I was gonna have to go through so much to find what was gonna be ultimately maybe one page in a book. And most of my other books take me nine to 11 years to write. This was lightning, six years, lightning speed for me. I said, you know, I I'm gonna come back here after I finish Hollywood Left and Right, because I want to know more about Nazis and fascists. There's almost nothing written about Nazis and fascists in LA during this period. And so I went back and I started going through the archives, but I had a hell of a time because Leon Lewis organized his archives the same way he organized his spy operation on a need to know basis. And so I couldn't figure out who would, because they all had code names, C19, N2, because he was afraid, they, he knew, they all knew who he was and they knew where his office was. And he thought if they break into my office and they open these files, they're gonna know who to kill. Because the Nazis threatened, um, they told the undercover operatives, if we ever discover who's spying, they're dead men. And in fact, three of Lewis's spies died under very highly um, suspicious circumstances. And I'm, I think all three were killed, but I'm sure two of them were either killed or allowed to die when they could have been saved. Um, and so uh, 
I'm reading through this and then USC and I'm, I still can't quite figure out the story. And then I found that USC had Joe Roos's archives. And when I went there the first day, I discovered he had written his autobiography with a professor from Cal State Northridge, Len Pitt, who had brought the archives there. And after reading 30 pages, I literally jumped up out of my seat, ran out of the library because I wanted to be a good patron and not make noise and yell, and called my wife up and said, I know what the story is. Because Joe Roos laid it out and it was like, now all the pieces made sense. And then the final reason for doing this is, this is the first time I've ever really written Jewish history. My parents are both Holocaust survivors. My mother was in Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, and then a munitions camp in Salzwedel. My father had been in the Warsaw Ghetto, and then in Dachau. And that's where he learned how to be a baker, was in the bakery at Dachau. And I had always wondered as a kid, how could Jews have let this happen? And why didn't they do more? And I promised myself that one day I'd try to figure out the answer. And when I came across this archive, I thought, now's the time to do that. And the most important thing I discovered is I had been asking the wrong question along with generations of Jewish historians and scholars. And the right question is not why, why didn't Jews do more, because they actually did. The question is, why didn't the American government do more? The hero of your story is Leon Lewis. Um, tell us more about him. You have a man here who does something quite heroic, quite remarkable. First of all, for the lawyers in the room, I think it's finally time he got a hero lawyer. Don't you think <laughs> that's kind of nice, right? Um, Self-sacrificing in the sense of giving up his clients, giving up his practice. Dangerous because if he was ever found out, he'd be mortal danger. Um, opposed by every member of the government until 1941, as you said, the sheriff, the the police department, the FBI, nobody listened to him, and yet he persists and persists and persists and persists. Tell us about him. What was the source of that resilience? And then tell us what happened to him after the war. You know, I, I, I can't tell you the source of his resilience because he was a very private man. He left no diaries, no records, other than the files at Cal State Northridge. He was a very private man, uh, he, neither his children nor Joe Roos's son, Leonard, who I interviewed, ever knew anything about what their fathers were doing. Leonard told me that the first time his father ever told him anything was when he was a young man, and he said, do you remember I told you the story of how once I came home and I had uh, tripped and my glasses were broken and my face was all scratched up. And he said, yeah, you told mom that you had fallen on the sidewalk. Because he had bottle, Coke bottle glasses. And like Julius, he's maybe 5'3", five, 5'4". Five, and he said, well, that wasn't the truth. I was actually jumped by two men. And they would have killed me. But someone came along in a car and slowed down and yelled, you know, what, what's going on? And the two guys ran away. But Leon Lewis just, I, I, I think there's sometimes you, in life, there are things that are so important that you're willing to give everything up to do what's the right thing. And there aren't many of us, including myself. I can't imagine I would be as heroic as Leon Lewis would be. And particularly to never give in the impulse of being violent. Some of his uh, spies carried guns with them. To, you know, because they were they weren't they would never use them first, but they were prepared to use them if they were jumped and and put in a mortally dangerous situation. So Lewis did this for his entire um, adult life, working for the ADL. You know, he worked for the ADL. He also uh, was one of the people who started Hillel. He edited the B'nai B'rith Messenger. He went around speaking to local groups throughout the Midwest. I mean, this man, his life was the ADL in Jewish causes. Uh, after the war, by the way, what's important to know is that once Pearl Harbor, you know, I end here on a nice note, right? It's not so nice. 
because I'm thinking now, what do I want to do? And I might do it, but the book ends in 41, but I have an epilogue that takes you from 41 to 45. He doesn't trust the FBI for good reason. He doesn't trust the police and he doesn't trust the sheriff. So after Pearl Harbor, he maintains his spy operation because he, he believes they'll go after Nazis, but they won't protect Jews. And he has a mother and daughter spy team working for him. And the daughter, Sylvia Comfort, is a stenographer. And so she joins every fascist group, every American first group, which was really Germany first. Um, and because she's a stenographer, for any of you who have been in voluntary associations, when the call goes up, who would be the sec who'd like to be the secretary and take minutes? Everyone looks down, right, look at whatever. Well, Sylvia would always raise her hand, and they knew she was a stenographer. So she became actually, the, she got involved in the inner circle of many of the secret groups that were going on that wanted notes to be taken. And the thing she told Leon Lewis, she said, you know, Leon, I, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but anti-Semitism has been going up after Pearl Harbor, not down. That all these groups who have been saying for years, these isolationist groups, the Jews are trying to get us in the war. The Jews are trying to get us in the war. And if they get us in the war, we're going to get them. Now we're going to get them. And she told them of uh, going to a meeting of the California Women's Republican Club where they were complaining. She said she heard four women in a dialogue and she wrote down the dialogue. One woman says, you know, there are too many Jewish emigres in Los Angeles and they're taking jobs away from hardworking Christians. And another woman said, well, then let's hang them by lampposts. A third woman says, no, that's going to take too long. And a fourth woman said, well, then let's at least sterilize them. And what we see is this idea of the good war, you know, that Americans recognized Hitler as evil. It's all a myth, folks. Anti-Semitism is intense in this city during Pearl Harbor. Uh, Gallup polls, I just did an event with the uh, US Holocaust Museum and they had all these statistics, Gallup polls, showing attitudes towards Jews and anti-Semitism is going up during the Pearl Harbor years, not going down. So Leon Lewis stays to the end, 45. He stays another year or two and then steps down. By the way, he transitions, his group becomes known as the Community Relations Committee. They give themselves a name. And that then becomes, instead of becoming a, uh, basically an investigative group spying on Nazis and fascists, they become a human rights organization. And they, uh, both uh, Leon Lewis helps pioneer the creation of the first human rights groups in the city and cross-cultural uh, religious groups coming together. He retires from the CRC, I think it's around 47, and goes into private practice, returns to private practice, and unfortunately has, he's driving along Pacific Coast Highway and I believe it's 1955, and he has a heart attack, and he dies in the middle of the highway. But Joe Roos is um, overlooked for two years. I think because he's short, he's a little prickly, he doesn't look like a leader, and he wrote in his memoir, the person they had replace Leon Lewis, he said, was a man who did only one thing well. He looked handsome in a uniform. <laughs> but apparently he was a shtummy. So he made it for two years and then Roos took it over and Roos really expanded it into interfaith councils. And Roos was one of the real drivers in interfaith councils and meetings in the city. And he eventually opened up his own public relations firm, worked for USC and donated his papers there. Uh, but if you want a really interesting story, what happened to George Gisling? George Gisling goes back and the minute he lands in Berlin, uh, I, had, I was telling someone as, during the little break here, um, I had a researcher going through his file in Germany because I don't read German. And I was going through the records for the Deutsche House. And I'd been finding, I'd been finding the same thing my researcher did, which was the Nazis in LA hated Gisling, hated his guts because 
He hated them and let it be known. He thought they were all fools. He wouldn't support the Bund. He wouldn't give them money unless he absolutely had to. And most of all, he wouldn't make anti-Semitic statements. And that's when I realized, when I read that letter from, uh, uh, I told you the 1947 one, I realized, wait a minute. I read all Gisling's public pronouncements in the newspapers. I suddenly realized he never once said anything anti-Semitic. He said, the persecution in Jews, reports about the persecution of Jews in Germany is exaggerated. But he never said anything about the Jews. And in the spy reports, and um, both Slocum and another spy, uh, Neil Ness, particularly Ness were, was close to him because Neil Ness knew the German ambassador, Hans Luther, and Luther said, tell you know, Gisling, you're my friend. And that got him entry. None of these guys ever reported Gisling ever saying anything anti-Semitic. So when they arrive in Germany, he is detained by the Gestapo in Gestapo headquarters for three nights and grilled. And before he went in, he told his daughter, don't say anything. If they come to interview you, just be a 13-year-old dumb girl. You don't know anything. Kind of like Sergeant Schultz in Hogan's Heroes. He's released after three days, but he knows he's being carefully monitored. And in 1944, when there was the uh, failed attempt on Hitler's life, a number of the assassins, German military officers, were his friends. And so he called in some favors and had another friend who was in Murano, northern Italy, uh, which is a whole other story, uh, get him transferred there. And he became the German consul in Murano. And he wound up being part of Operation Sunrise, which was a small number of German diplomats and German generals were secretly meeting with OSS head Alan Dulles in Bern, Switzerland, negotiating the surrender of all German forces in northern Italy. And on May 6th, he leads a group that surrenders to the Allied forces. He's arrested and he's sent to Nuremberg and he remains in jail for two years until they get the letter from Julius Klein and then he's released and he goes to Spain and that's where he lives until the rest of his days. And then the other interesting story is Hermann Schwinn, who I didn't speak about much but is the kind of main villain in the book. Hermann Schwinn is arrested after Pearl Harbor and he's kept in jail until 1947 and he's deported to Argentina where he joins all his friends. Uh, his wife, who's an American-born, joins him in Argentina, but after a year, she can't stand it there, and so he, she moves to Florida. And he, uh, a year later, decides he'd rather be with his wife than with his Nazi buddies, real Nazis, not like him. And he moves to Florida, and where does he die? He dies several miles from where my parents live, in Dade County, Florida, the highest concentration of survivors in all of America. And the only thing I wondered is, what the hell did he tell his neighbors he did during the war? <laughs> what a story. What yeah. A, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, we have a few minutes before we're going to conclude, and I'm going to send the professor back over the hill. So um, Louise has our microphone, and she's the keeper of the mic. I think Norman has a question right over here, at least over here. And uh, she's going to take some questions. And remember that in our synagogue, for those of your visitors, and we're certainly delighted you're here and hope that you'll come back many times. But we have a rule here at VBS. A question is a single sentence interrogatory <laughs> that begins with the word what, why, when, where, and how and ends with a question mark. If it's more than one sentence, I will interrupt you. OK? If you want to give a sermon, we're delighted to have you give a sermon. Come any Shabbos morning, we'll give you the pulpit. But this evening, please don't ask, don't you know that? Please ask the professor to clarify or elaborate. Uh, Steve? You mean I can't read from the Talmud first? No, no, and... no, please don't. <laughs> well, this is two sentences. One, I had heard James Cagney tried to lead Hollywood at Madison Square Garden for an anti-Nazi rally. And the other, were there any physical Jewish Antabund members, physical abuse, you know, in LA. There was in Chicago, I heard, the silver shirts got ripped so many times, physically. 
Any, any here and the James Cagney. The only one I heard about was during the war. At one point, um, Bugsy Siegel wound up in jail. And uh, Bugsy Siegel, you know, is part of the Meyer Lansky group. And apparently he asked to be put in a jail with some of the Nazis who were jailed there. And several hours later, the police came back and found the Nazis beaten very <laughs> badly. But I didn't come across, a, you know, I, I can't say, I didn't come across any instances where I know in Chicago uh, a lot of Jews went in. In fact, um, Jack Ruby was one of the people who was in Chicago during the 30s. It's in the Warren Commission report at the end that Jack Ruby went in and was part of a group that found out about Bund meetings and went in and beat the hell out of the Bund and they stopped holding public meetings after that. Great. Yes, Are there any fascist or Nazi groups either underground or overground now? in LA today? Of course there are. I just don't know them. Uh, you know, the, 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 um, the Jewish freshman who was murdered recently, Bernstein, uh, apparently his murderer belonged, went to a kind of neo-Nazi camp and was part of a little neo-Nazi group. There are, here's what I would tell you is these hate groups have existed and have, have not stopped existing since the 1920s on the West Coast. And they just, they've been underground all these years until a president emerges who says there are good people on both sides. Well, I want to tell you, there aren't good people on both sides. If you belong to the Klan, you belong to a white supremacist group, I don't care if you're nice to your dog, your children, your wife, your husband, you are not a good person. Now, let me, let, I just want to clarify something. I, I, I confess I haven't read the book yet, but Slocum, you said, was a member of the Klan. He was he, a leader of the Klan. He, no, he only became a leader for Leon Lewis. For Leon Lewis. Yeah, he quit. He was going to quit the Klan when he realized, again, you know, anti-communism is one thing. Yeah. That's sort of political hatred. It's not personal per se. For some people it's personal because Jews and commies are one and the same. But to hate blacks because they're black, to hate Jews because they're Jews, to hate Catholics because they're Catholics, that's what led Slocum to quit the Klan. He didn't believe in that. He didn't join a hate group. And when he realized what the Klan was, he was ready to quit. But then he thought he could do more good by spying on them. And it was Leon Lewis who said, become an officer if you can, so that you can really find out what's going on. And he did, and he never, imagine, he never told any of his friends. That, to me, is unbelievable courage. He went through the entire war where people apparently dropped him as friends, because how can I be a friend with you? You're an active Klan member, I'm proud of it. And yet he kept doing it because he felt it was the right thing to do. Wow. Please. Yeah, hi. Um, during that time period, the, the movie The Great Dictator was made with Charlie Chaplin. Uh, how did that get made in that environment where the, the, uh, uh, the studios were trying to be, uh, let's say, politically correct? Um, because the first anti not first of all, that was 1940. The first anti-Nazi film that came out was the, in April 1939, Confessions of a Nazi Spy. And the only reason that was able to come out and get the approval was because it was based on a true story. It wasn't a movie to that denigrated, attacked, or in any day way mocked Germany. It was the true story of a spy ring that had been broken by the FBI. There was a trial in New York in September 1938. Warner Brothers immediately sent out one of its best writers because Jack and Harry wanted to make an anti-Nazi movie. And they just couldn't do it as long as they needed a seal. And they said, now we've got a chance to tell the true story. The trial ended with the conviction of eight, 18 spies in December. By January, there was a screenplay that had been submitted to the production code. The, I went through the letters from the production code and the uh, censor for the production code wrote in his letter, he says, technically, to Joseph Breen, 
the head of the uh, production code administration. Technically, this film fits within the code because it's based on a true event and it's not based upon any attack on Germany. But given all the wonderful things that Hitler has done for the German nation and its people, do we really want Hollywood to produce this kind of a movie? And I strongly urge you to convince the Warners not to make this film. Now, you also have to understand, we have, the movie industry is the most extraordinary thing. You have Jews making movies that are being censored by Catholics for Protestants, men, women, and children. January 1940, the war, once you got six months of the war, the production code suspends Article 10. And studios now can make anti-Nazi films. Charlie Chaplin had the great dictator in the works before January 40. And once the code uh, said, gave him the go ahead, he went right into filming and a number of the studios begin turning out. If you want to see anti-Nazi films, they're all 1940, 41. That's why, because they can now make the films and get them in first run theaters. Someone going to make your book into a film? Well, funny you should say. <laughs> Tom Hanks says Leonard Leo that's, Lewis. That's what, yeah. he's, that's what everyone says, but we are actually, I have a, uh, it sounds so strange for a history professor to say, I have an agent at ICM. Ooh. And we are, um, <laughs> nego there have been 70, over 70, because I keep getting them every week. Probably had 75 production companies, yeah. writers, production companies sure. call, and I met with three of them, and one of them I really liked, and we're now in negotiation. Um, and hopefully, I would actually prefer it to be an extended series, one of the mini series, like on Amazon or Netflix, because there's so many stories to tell. Yeah. I don't want it told in two hours. I want it told over six, eight. 10 episodes. That's a great idea. Yes, this was quite an organization to run so many spies. Can you tell us a little bit about the financing, about such a big organization? How did he get the money to run the spy ring? He got the money from the moguls. Again, 424,000 went, uh, it was actually 24,000 in 1934, which if you go on measuringworth.com, and if you want to know, so what is that? in you know, today's dollar. When I was a kid, I made only $5 a day. Well, that $5 a day may be a few hundred a day today. I don't know. You can go onto this website. You type in the amount of money, the year, the initial year, and then you can go, right now it goes up to, I think, either 2016 or 2017, and they'll tell you. So the moguls kept funding it. And I will tell you this, once, oh, there's a great scene, and I want this, if, if this gets made, this scene has to be in there. Um, Leon Lewis managed to plant several people inside Deutsch House. The interesting thing about when I talked about his, he operated on a need to know basis, no spy knew who any of the other spies were. So I have one series of spy reports by uh, someone who had been the, one of, uh, uh, Captain Roberts Pape first secretary in the Friends of New Germany in 1933, fell on hard times, went to work as a waiter in Deutsch Haus that had a big uh, beer hall and uh, was eventually um, let go of that. And he was angry and he went to Leon Lewis and said, I I'm going to go spy for you. And so he did. And he sends Lewis a report. He says, if there's any um, sabotage or any murder or anything, the first person you should go get is Chuck Slocum. He is a bad egg. He's involved in everything here. Um, so uh, they're, they're crisscrossing, and the money is, is, at one point, it's either Slocum, and I forget the German's name now, one of them plants a tape recorder in Hermann Schwinn's office. And apparently he tapes the conversation that Schwinn has with McLaughlin about the murder plot. And he gets the tape, Leon Lewis gets the tape, calls a number of the moguls and says, I just want you to hear this. And he plays the tape and he writes in, his, uh, in a memo later, he said, what frightened, what really frightened them was not that there was a murder plot, 
but they talked about it and the details of how the death plot would be carried out as though they were organizing a Sunday picnic. He had no problem getting money from the moguls after that. Wow. Let's take one more question. Who has the mic, please? This, this summer I went for a hike in the Pacific Palisades and I watched a group of taggers spray painting the so-called Nazi house. What can you uh, say about that? A lot of things. I could say buy the book and find out. I could say wait for the movie or the TV show. But I'll tell you, it's um, in 1933, 34, a very wealthy family, the Stevens, both of them uh, coming from wealth, uh, fall under the sway of a mysterious Herr, Sch Herr Schmidt, who is a kind of Svengali-like uh, mystic who tells them that he has foreseen the future. And you know what? Maybe he wasn't so crazy because he said, I've foreseen the future, and the future is that Adolf Hitler is going to conquer all of Europe. And then after he conquers all of Europe, he's going to conquer America, and he will fashion an alliance with Japan. This is coming 34. It's pretty prescient. And so he needs a place that he can establish what I would call the Western White House, that his central, excuse me, headquarters in America, because LA is halfway, roughly halfway between Berlin and Tokyo. And so they have an architect draw up plans for a 22 bedroom uh, compound that has its own water tower, which is still survive, his own power plant, its own meat locker, its own vegetable gardens, and then the whole thing would be surrounded by an electric fence. They had the blueprints, and then they decide they need it even more elaborate, so they hire a um, second architect, who is ironically, for those of you who know names from the past, Paul Williams. Not the singer, but Paul Williams, the most famous African-American architect in the city. I can't believe that Paul Williams knew who he was building this for. I've got to imagine he was just told it's for this eccentric uh, American family. Um, and to this day, the, the, um, everyone has a different story of what the building is, but I think it was the groundskeeper house is still there. It's concrete, it's abandoned, it's tagged. And there's part of the water tower and there are still remains from some of the walls that were built around there. But there were reports, and people have come to talks have said, I know from my parents or friends that they used to know about people would do um, rifle practice in there and were shooting guns in there. And in fact, they were. They were drilling for Der Tag, the day that the Nazis would seize control of America. And this was, by the way, the underlying, and I'm giving you little plots but the big one is they were preparing to rise up and to seize control of the American government. Really? <laughs> so what, what I, I, wanna, I, wanna get, I wanna ask you for one last, because you've been very, very disciplined tonight and I wanna congratulate you on that. Because every time you got even a little bit close to answering the question of, okay, and so what do you learn now? Um, what do you learn now, Professor? What, what's the, you gave us a beautiful ending about Americans the, the definition of a hy hyphenated America. But now when you look at this plot, you look at Leon Lewis's courage, you look at uh, Gisling's, Gisling's courage, Slocum's courage, uh, conscience, um, and you look at a government that was unwilling to do anything because they themselves were taken up with this notion of Jews as commies and commies as Jews. And then you open the morning paper. Well, I spoke at Wilshire Boulevard uh, it was it two weeks ago now? And uh, the last question someone asked me was very much the same. And that was, well, who's, who are the Leon Lewises of today? And my answer then, without even thinking, is the same one I'll tell you now. Look to the left of you, look to the right of you, and then look at yourself in a mirror. And that's the answer. Everyone in this room can be a Leon Lewis. Now, you don't have to run a spy ring. Nor, in, and in fact, people have said, well, are you suggesting we should go out and have undercover agents? And I would say no. Three people died. That's a very dangerous thing to do. But 
what we can do. You know, there's, there's um, I belong to Leo Beck. And until this year, we used to have our own for the, ho for the high holidays, Leonard Bierman and Sandy Reagans, our former rabbis, created their own prayer book, much of which had both, um, it had poetry in it, it and it had traditional teachings. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't remember which one of the sages said this, but it was for Yom Kippur. God says to Moses, I don't ask you to be like me. I only ask you to be the best of yourself. And I think that's the right answer, which is, so what can you do without putting yourself in danger? You hear someone speaking hate, say something. You, see, you hear somebody talking about those goddamn Muslims, those goddamn this, those goddamn that, say, you know what, I'm sorry, I have to stop you there. We don't talk that way in America. We're Americans, and everyone has a right to believe what they want to believe as long as they leave you alone and don't attack you or get in your face. That we are a country that really does believe in tolerance and toleration. So you hear hate speech, say something. You hear there's going to be a uh, white supremacist demonstration, turn out. Because I can tell you one story of it matters. Uh, one of my closest friends here is the head of the National Lawyers Guild in LA. Lawyers here might know him, Jim Lafferty. And Jim has a whole network. He's at every demonstration in Los Angeles in the region. And he has a council he works with of rabbis, priests, ministers, and imams. And he had recently heard, several months ago, after Charlottesville, he heard about white supremacist group that were organizing a demonstration. They were going to hold a rally in a park, and I forget where it was. He called up one of the black pastors, and I guess the park wasn't that far, and he said, I want you to get your entire congregation out to that park on Sunday. And he called up a number of other rabbis, ministers, imams, and said, I want you to get a number of your congregants out there that Sunday. Tell them to bring a picnic. That's all. Tell them that there were, you know, the white supremacists wanted to hold a demonstration there. We're going to go there earlier, and we're going to occupy the, the land. He had people posted. His observers from the Lawyers Guild were posted all around the park and like a block or two away waiting for, to see these cars coming in. And he said he spotted them, that there were several cars, you know, maybe two dozen people, several cars that drove to the park and apparently circled the park once, looked at what was going on and drove away. And that was the end of their demonstration. If we stand up to hate, hate has no place to stand. And the one thing I would say is I do not endorse they're now out of the press, but Antifa, the anti-fascist groups, who said, and I understand it, and I have to tell you, if I was in my 20s, I would probably feel the way they did. I'm coming prepared for violence. Some of them are coming with weapons, and they're prepared to fight and to beat the, either get beat up or beat the hell out of these people. The problem with that is the minute that any of us engage in violence, then a Donald Trump or someone like him can say, see, there are bad people on both sides. And it totally, when you put Jewish protesters protesting hate in the same camp as the haters, we have no place to go. So it has to be passive resistance. It has to be, as I say, it is not too great for any of us, even though it may seem awkward, but imagine if you have the courage, you hear somebody making an anti-Semitic, anti-black, anti any kind of racist statement, if you stand up or just say, you don't even have to stand, say, I don't want to hear that. That doesn't work in this country. We don't talk that way. It's going to give somebody else near you the courage to join in. And imagine if every time, because these are a small number of people, if every time they opened their mouth they were shut up by someone, you would see a vast decline in hate, at least open hate. Whatever you may have in your head or heart, keep it in your head or heart. Don't open your mouth and don't make it somebody else's problem because you hate other people. Thanks so much. Thank you. And I, I will pull up a chair here if you, as I say, if you 
Want to buy a book? I'll stay until they're all signed. Thanks for coming. <laughs>